Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to episode two of the Spacewalk Podcast. Yeah, so we've got a little show here for you guys. Normally, I'm trying to kind of stick to like a general theme or topic, and this week's theme is there is no theme. <laughs> I did find a few things that kind of string together, a few questions from you guys that kind of string together, but today we're gonna to be talking about kind of like weather and conditional restraints of launching rockets. We'll be talking a little bit about ULA and Blue Origin and also the Artemis program and kind of how they all fit in together. So yeah, let's get started. All right, so this first question comes from, uh, we, we kind of have the same question from two people. So this one's from Head Crab Zombie, which is at uh, the Nethy guy on Twitter. And there's also Max, at who is at uh, XJL underscore four on Twitter. Um, well, Head, Head Crab Zombie specifically asks, how much of a difference does the size of a rocket make to its ability to launch? And ooh, we got a car. Some ambient audio for you all, for your listening pleasure. Um, how much difference does the size of a rocket make to its ability to launch in poor terrestrial weather? Could us launch when Electron was grounded? And then uh, Max also says, how can we increase the likelihood of successful launches in bad weather? Is there anything that can help prevent and reduce weather delays and scrubs? So, okay, this is a great question. To be honest, this is, this is one that I don't, I mean, I've got some, I've got some, I know a few things about it, but I don't know, like, I don't know the big giant limiting factor per launch vehicle. One of the big ones though, the, so ground winds, the biggest reason for ground winds, like, you know, when you're just sitting there and it said, I'm gonna use miles an hour, sorry. Uh, like say there's a 20 mile an hour sustained wind or something. The big concern there is when the rocket takes off that it could just kind of be getting tipped over, get tipped towards the launch pad, um, get tipped off angle from the launch clamps. There's just a few things specifically with taking off that more or less is, is going to be a ratio of, it's kind of the, it's drag coefficient versus it's like mass ratio. So a, a rocket, like actually I'm recording this on the day of likely the last Delta IV Heavy. So he, this is a perfect example. Del Delta IV Heavy has a huge surface area compared to its mass. Because it is, has, has so much hydrogen and it's hydrogen boosters, the surface area is massive. And uh, so realistically, you know, Delta IV Heavy is, you know, it kind of competes most of the time with like, a, you know, Atlas V kind of has some crossover points almost. Like it's not that much more powerful than an Atlas V uh, in its fullest configuration. And Vulcan's literally able to completely do everything that the Delta IV Heavy can do basically. So if you, you, know, you look at that, the Vulcan, uh, yes, it will have some solid rocket boosters, but it's altogether, you know, smaller than a tri-core uh, Delta IV Heavy. Now Delta IV Heavy, because it's tri-core, because it's that, that heavy configuration like that with the two strap-on boosters, uh, what's interesting about that is when it's facing, you know, if you're the wind and you're looking at it in one direction, you know, from a certain thing, the, the three cores will be aligned and it will look just like a single rocket. So from that point of view, the wind doesn't have as much cross effect, cross wind effect, you know, it doesn't have as much surface area to grab onto. Now, if the wind's coming from 90 degrees to that, where it sees all three cores, its surface area is effectively tripled, basically. So therefore, depending on, you know, the crosswind, uh, that has huge launch constraints, differences on it. So I remember when I, the first rocket I really could actually see and fully experience fully was a Delta IV Heavy, which is why it's always got a good place in my heart. And it was for the launch of uh, Orion EFT-1. And I remember it was like the big talk was on one of the scrub days was, oh man, it, you know, it's, it's looking like it's going to go, but the, the winds right now are like right at the limit. But if it shifts direction, it would be totally fine. And it was like, because from this direction, it would push the rocket into the launch tower. Uh, and specifically again, because the three cores just have so much surface area. Now, so this varies completely from rocket to rocket. You know, people are quick to look at Starship and go, man, that thing has you know, just a, a, a crazy amount of surface area. Like, you know, I, I can't believe it can handle any wind at liftoff. And the reality is it's also extremely, extremely heavy. And it's more dense than hydrogen, the, the methane and methylox. So it's, you know, it's more dense. So therefore it won't get pushed around by the wind as much. 
but of course it has the you know arrow features like flaps so again it might have certain constraints from certain directions that other rockets wouldn't have to consider because it has those flaps open um, while sitting on the pad i'm still kind of surprised they don't just tuck them away but maybe you get some weird mock things going on and weird i don't know that that still does just kind of surprise me so yeah so that so that's one of the big ones is, is kind of the ground winds is is effectively going to be you know how much does wind push this rocket around and just because it's a smaller rocket doesn't necessarily mean the wind's going to push it more it, it can but again like if electron is actually more dense you know it has a tiny surface area so there's actually less chance of wind pushing it around but um and it's, and it's carelock so it's actually quite dense so it might actually be affected by ground wind less than other rockets now the big one for rockets though the big one is as it's ascending the winds change you know if you look at jet streams they're going literally you know you go from all sorry now i'm going to kilometers from one kilometer to another kilometer oftentimes the winds are like 180 degrees from each other it's crazy like jet streams are wild and, <laughs> and it's really hard to you know kind of know uh, it's something that we don't really experience unless you're like flying and you happen to realize that your flight got in 30 minutes earlier or whatever but realistically you know most of us don't really think of or have much to do with with jet streams but the reality is as a rocket's ascending it's passing through different layers really quickly you know it could be going from a, a wind shear that's going in one direction to a wind shear that's going in another direction literally in like a second and they could be going 180 degrees to each other which puts a huge bending moment in the rocket not just necessarily because like not like the wind is hitting it that hard but because the engines have to gimbal and compensate for that wind and you know steer into the wind and, and maintain its trajectory so it's it's kind of this whole it's a whole you know co combination of things the, the shifting of the wind plus the compensation to stay on course can really put a big bending moment in the rocket so a rocket for a long time the falcon 9 was like just seemed like it was so susceptible to upper winds and i remember like it just seemed like it was always scrubbing because like yeah upper winds aren't good today and the reason was and i still don't really know the solution but the reason was it's the finest rocket ever produced finest meaning the finest ratio of width to, to height so because it's so tall and relatively skinny 3.7 meters wide and 70 meters tall so its ratio is like double or triple that of some other rockets flying so therefore it you know it's basically tall and skinny and can snap like a pencil <laughs> so i don't know what they did to mitigate it or if it was just increased confidence in their you know the, re the reality is with rockets so much stuff can be tweaked in in software so literally let's say they just kind of you know flew a bunch of times and then they realized hey you know what we could actually let the wind kind of push us around and we'll correct for it after we get through that phase and in that that way we don't have to beef the rocket up anymore we just kind of let it get tossed around a bit we don't stress it anymore by trying to compensate we just fly it and i mean i don't that, that's an example but there's so many little things you could you know throttle down a little bit more through those sections or something there are clever things that people do so maybe they just expanded their envelope because i hardly hear of that you know especially as falcon 9 is launching like every three or four days these days i just i'm not hearing that as often of like upper level winds i mean you still hear it sometimes of course but i i feel like maybe it's anecdotally that we used to hear it literally like every every launch almost it was crazy but yeah those are kind of the big ones you know that you have other considerations with weather and things like tribal electrification which is how much static discharge the rocket has as, as it's ascending um you know metal does a good job of discharging static um just naturally especially like stainless steel something highly conductive but um it's like uh rockets that are fully carbon composite on the other hand struggle quite a bit with this because they they can build up static electricity and that can be really really bad so they have to use normally like some kind of paint or gloss or some something you know a, a clear coat to reduce and and allow it to have proper static discharge or or they have to, I, I don't exactly know this is one that i have to kind of study a little more but my understanding yes that it uh carbon composite that's a, that's a big thing that they, they had to figure out and rocket lab was kind of one of the first ones to really get into the weeds there because they're the first company to fully succeed in a you know fully carbon composite orbital class rocket so kudos to them that was very very cool um yeah so so that's kind of the weather thing um this is a topic that i could probably get way more into someday and but i you know i think you look at something like the soyuz i, I think there is just a risk posture involved and you know again every company has to kind of set their bounds and their limits and their thresholds and uh yeah like soyuz launches 
with no visibility and in horrible snow often. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad weather conditions. It looks bad. It looks crazy. But, um, you know, it, it does seem like they launched that thing just whenever. Like, they don't know what a weather constraint is, I feel like, almost. And again, I don't know if that's a difference in program management, a difference in hardware. Is it actually that much beefier and, and made like a tank? You know, kind of in my head, like the Soyuz is like this like beefy tank of a, of a rocket. And realistically, no, it's, it's thin and, you know, relatively high performing. Actually, it's considering how like primitive its engines are and primitive so many of its things are, it's, it's almost higher performing than it deserves to be. <laughs> well, I guess that again, it's taking up a teeny, 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 tiny little capsule. So... I guess uh, that's that's why, but I still I'm still fond of that thing. It's it's ridiculous, but it, you know it has totally different constraints and totally different considerations than any other rocket flying. And uh, yeah, to each their own, I guess. Um, yeah, again, that's not something that I know a ton about, but there's everything that I that I do know. <laughs> All right, so the next question we kind of get into a string of questions that are a little bit related. Um, this one, and so those first two, by the way, people just ha use hashtag spacewalk podcast and we found it there we didn't you know uh so make sure if you have a question to use hashtag spacewalk podcast anywhere even if it's like under say you see a news article and you're like just tag me just hey hey tim you know or hey at everyday astronaut i want you to talk about this on hashtag spacewalk podcast and you know if, I, if we see it I'll, I'll be taking a look every week you know i'll pull it up so this one comes from um billy j bryant on discord Ask, saying, hot take, where does Blue Origin fit in the emerging world of Artemis and HLS? Um, how do they make an impact on space exploration at this point in history? And uh, while we're at it, I'm kind of going to kind of wrap a few of these together because they are about ULA and Blue Origin. Um, Larry uh, McCutch, Mc, uh, McCutcheon on uh, Patreon says, um, are the, basically, what are your thoughts on the idea of Blue Origin buying ULA? Uh, would it be good for the space industry? And Douglas um, Igluyawuk, sorry if I totally, totally just ruined that. <laughs> what does the future of ULA look like? Um, how much work was done um, on the, fin oh, this is different, but yeah, what does the future of ULA look like? So, um, yeah, we'll kind of talk about ULA and Blue Origin, that relationship for a little bit, and then we'll wrap that into the, the first bit asked about Ar uh, Artemis, so we'll finish with an Artemis question, and there's my segues. <laughs> now you see how I'm wrapping this together. So basically, okay, uh, and so, uh, by the way, thanks to Larry and Douglas and Billy for all being Patreon members. Thank you very much. And uh, be sure, if you are a supporter on X or Patreon or Twitter or YouTube or whatever, wherever, if you are a supporter, I, I will be putting a link every week or every episode uh, soliciting questions. So be sure and get your questions in there because I do look at that first. So that's going to be where I always pull from every episode is a supporter question. So, okay, so let's talk, let's talk... Uh, yeah, so basically, Blue Origin is in a really interesting position. They put themselves, and ULA put themselves, in an extremely interesting position. So let's first talk about uh, that relationship. So the biggest thing that's crazy with that relationship is that ULA, in my opinion, this is purely my opinion, I, I don't hope I'm not disparaging anyone at ULA. I love the company. Um, love. I know a lot of people that work there, fantastic people, hardworking people, but they kind of really did themselves a disservice when they purchased the BE-4 engine for Vulcan. The reason I say that is the longer that engine took, the more at risk they put themselves. And the longer they, the, like literally every single year that Vulcan was not flying, ended up being an opportunity for New Glenn to get more closer and closer to operational. And New Glenn is obviously owned by Blue Origin, relies on those same BE-4 engines. So you can kind of see where if the BE-4 engines aren't ready, oh, guess what? The, you know, the new Glenn vehicle continues progress, continues to progress, continues to evolve and mature. And Bob's your uncle, next thing you know, by the time the BE-4 is ready, oh, look, new Glenn's right around the corner too. So it kind of is a thing of like, man, that, I mean, I don't think there's, I don't, not think there's anything nefarious about it at all. Like I, I, on Blue Origin side either, they, they're just trying to get that engine ready. They want it to be ready. They want it to be flying. They, you know, wanted New Glenn to be flying forever. They wanted Vulcan to be flying forever, but it just so happens that engine development is hard. And, and this is extremely important to remember. There are a few exceptions throughout history, you know, like F1 and stuff, but basically any engine you've ever seen fly, Whatever target the company first said, you have to double it, at least. 
two or three times the timeline. It's just simply what it takes. No one, and that might be getting better as we collectively, we, the royal we, humanity gets better at developing, you know, rocket engines. Uh, that time might be reducing. We have better software, better models, better hardware, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is like, people say, yeah, we'll have a, you know, we'll first test fire an engine in, in, in one year from now. And it takes two. And that's just what it takes. And then to, you know, from test firing to actually getting it certified and ready to go, you know, that can go from, you know, yeah, that'll be in two years, we'll have this thing certified. And it takes four. And that's just simply the reality of the aerospace industry. And that's pretty much across the board, not just engines, like everything, everything, just double it. When I, I hate, or I hear so many people like, you know, always lambasting, in particular Elon, because he always throws out schedules. He's, he's throwing out schedules too often. So it's really easy to pin him down on this, but people are like, yeah, he said we're gonna be on Mars by now. In 2016, he said we'll be there by 2024. Okay, well, if you were smart, you would have doubled it. <laughs> you would have said 16 years from that point, you know, 2032 or whatever. Um, and the, because the reality is every program, look at any program, you know, Starliner, SLS, oh, those are both Boeing, uh, but literally anything, Neutron, uh, you know, Space Shuttle. I mean, everything just takes longer than you think and it's roughly double so whenever you hear an estimate of time just do yourself a favor don't get too like caught up on it double it and that's just simply my rule of thumb so the reality is though oh we're gonna have a loud traffic sorry this is the beauty of spacewalk is <laughs> there we go okay so the reality is uh blue origin has set themselves up really nice at this point Vulcan and ULA, I think, did everything they could with their kind of where they were at when they made the decision to make Vulcan. You know, in 2014, they were really hoping to have Vulcan online a lot sooner. You know, they were hoping to have it online. If I remember right, I remember hearing it was going to fly in 2018, maybe even 2017. But I remember listening to them announce, you know, their new vehicle and blah, blah, blah. And I'm pretty sure it's like three or four years away. And like I said, double or triple that is what you need to do. And at the time when they were developing and beginning to actually like, you know, solidify the designs for Vulcan, it still looked like a viable launcher. And frankly, today it still is an extremely high performing rocket. There are very few rockets that can actually do some of the missions that Vulcan is capable of. And it actually does it at a surprisingly competitive price. But the, the caveat here is that that competitive price is likely, you know, somewhat subsidized and or, you know, SpaceX just undercuts themselves and undersells themselves. Uh, or I mean, over, wait, they charge what they can, we'll say, and they could easily undercut more if they needed to. There's just a lot more, um, a lot more meat on the bones when you're full, you know, using a, a reusable booster. But um, Vulcan, to me, you know, I think, I don't think it's gonna win too many commercial contracts outside of what it's already signed. I don't think it's going to win too many more, you know, I don't think it's really gonna be flying too much beyond what it's already slated to fly. I think it's highly likely actually that Blue Origin buys them. I think that makes sense because they could, there's a lot of things that ULA probably has and does and, and, and teams and, and talent that ULA has currently that would be beneficial to Blue Origin. Blue Origin could soak up all those contracts, bring them all in house, run them all under one roof and I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I wouldn't be too shocked if that is what ends up happening. And yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel like, yeah, I, and I feel like Vulcan will still fly because it, there, there's a handful of missions. It's going to be a long time before they actually get New Glenn ramped up to be able to do the, you know, the constellations and things they need to do with, with New Glenn. So, you know, realistically, yeah, I actually do think that buying that, that, if Blue Origin were to buy ULA, it actually would make a lot of sense uh, for both, honestly. Because <laughs> that's the other part is like, I honestly don't know what ULA does after this. Like they spent so much time and money in, in R&D building a rocket that's, I hate to call it obsolete. I don't want to call it obsolete in the sense that like, it is competitive, it is highly a high performing rocket, but I just really don't see it surviving in a Starship world. And whether or not we get a full, you know, the full Starship world that we're hoping to get, you know, that's still up in the air, of course. But if that comes, if we get the fully reusable, rapidly reusable Starship and 
you know, it costs $10 million to launch that thing. No, like Vulcan's not surviving in that economy, period. So yeah, I, I think it's good because I don't, I don't think, you know, I don't think ULA can pivot at this point. I think the engine reusability thing is smart because those are expensive engines, but like they gotta get to it. <laughs> they really, they gotta get to it if they want any chance to really compete in, you know, in this marketplace. So yeah, so, and so on that mark of like, what's Blue Origin gonna do? Are they too late? Absolutely not. So it's so funny because I hear this about Blue Origin, but yet, you know, so many people will look at like, you know, for instance, when Rocket Lab started developing Neutron, people were like, yes, finally, you know, they're working on a bigger rocket so they can finally compete. Well, Rocket Lab, and I love Rocket Lab, by the way, this is absolutely not a dig to Rocket Lab. I think they're doing as much as they can with, with their funding. They're building, a, they're building a Falcon 9 competitor, right? the Neutron. By the time Neutron's online, like Falcon 9 will probably be beginning the end of its phase, you know, like beginning, the beginning of the end it might be like five or 10 years, you know, I'm not talking like phasing it out immediately, but you know, it, we're looking at like, if again, if the Starship economy is real and that stuff all fleshes out, Falcon 9 itself will be extremely obsolete and therefore its competitors will be obsolete. And Neutron is a Falcon 9 competitor through and through. It's a, it seems like a very compelling one, but it's funny that people get so excited about Neutron, like, yes. But what's funny is New Glenn is actually totally leapfrogging, not only Falcon 9, but it's actually in some ways higher performing than Falcon Heavy even, and still reusable. So that's what's nuts, is, is New Glenn is actually a very, very, very big and very powerful rocket. And it's going from, you know, people to see the suborbital thing, they think, oh, neat neat party trick, but they forget that like Blue Origin was actually working on leapfrogging Falcon 9 this whole time. Like that's been the goal from day one is to beat Falcon 9. And that's, I think that's, that's important because yes, they're probably going to be, ironically, it's probably going to be going online, you know, <laughs> right within the same few years as Starship, which again means SpaceX will basically leapfrog it relatively quickly, most likely in performance and price, but they're getting their foot in the door with what will likely be an extremely competitive vehicle. And they have some huge plans. They, not only are they building, of course, a lunar lander for the Artemis program, they also are doing, you know, they're working on their orbital reef, their, their orbital space station. I mean, there's a lot of things, and, and they're also working on an internet constellation like everybody, but there's a lot of things that Blue Origin is working on that like, they're kind of in their own lane. And I just think people are, very focused on on SpaceX and they just see what SpaceX has done and almost feel like well there's no room for anybody else and frankly that's a horrible thing because I don't want just a monopoly in space I want as many options as there are in case something happens you know and anything can happen all the time so you, it's always nice to have backups and alternatives but the reality is yeah Blue Origin is kind of doing a lot of things on their own like in their own way and they're blending what feels like to me a very traditional aerospace approach with a fast and modern, it might not seem fast, but I think behind the scenes, it's a lot more um, agile and a lot more new space than it may appear. We just don't see it. So that's kind of where it's frustrating that we, you know, as, as a fan base, that we don't get to necessarily see all the things, although they are getting way more open about it. And uh, yeah, I, I'm really excited when, when New Glenn flies, it's going to be awesome. And I think we're, all in for a nice treat. And if they land the first one, like it'll be insane, right? Like we all need to just absolutely call that for what it is from, you know, a tiny suborbital booster to landing a huge orbital class booster. I mean, the booster itself is, is massive. The booster itself is like, you know, almost the size of, of super heavy. Like it's, it's huge. It's, it's way up there. It's so much bigger than people I think realize it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be impressive. Um, so Blue Origin, I'm extremely hopeful for. They have funding, obviously. They have uh, infrastructure. That's the other thing. Like, they have what Starbase is working on becoming right now. And they've had it for a long time. And they're starting to finally utilize it. They're finally starting to utilize the, the manufacturing capabilities that they built. So it has a lot of potential. And that makes me excited. Again, I, I don't want a uh, monopoly. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's kind of my thoughts on that. I'm trying to keep this relatively quick. Um, and lastly, just to kind of round this whole thing out, we talked about Artemis a little bit, but Dave on Patreon just says, uh, what if Starship really does become 10 or 100 or 1,000 times cheaper 
than anything else in a couple of years. Again, the Starship economy we were ta talking about and the, but the, the way this really ties together, perfect segue, could that affect the Artemis program or SLS? So I think realistically, you know, SLS isn't going anywhere for the next handful. Any, any hardware that's being built today is safe. There are contracts, of course, from a lot more hardware for the Artemis program with SLS and Orion. But I do, it is still at risk, slight risk of being canceled if, you know, if SpaceX gets HLS to the moon for way cheaper than one SLS launch, which I hope that's the case. And if they have the ability to just literally send a crew, you know, on like basically to prove out, hey, we could, we could still launch with Dragon. We could do a DM, you know, or a, 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 a commercial crew launch with just people on Dragon like normal get them up into low Earth orbit and then use a Starship tug that basically is just sending people to and from the moon or to and from the human landing system or whatever. Of course, to me, like, I don't care who you are. <laughs> At some point in Congress, they're going to go, hey, wait, how much does it cost to ride on this thing versus that thing? Hmm. Why aren't we doing this one? And I mean, that might be 10 years from now. It might be a long time before that really, because Congress and, and slow moving, you know, just kind of the, the way politics works is especially with spaceflight and contracts is, man, it has to slap them across the face a lot before anything changes. They're gonna have to see, you know, like Falcon 9 had a hard time just even getting any government contracts for a long time because it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't really like certified for that. And was, they had a uphill battle and it wasn't until they're just absolutely proving themselves with a reliable track record that, and a lower price point that finally they're like, oh, all right. And now it's like they're winning everything, right? They're like the default because now they've proven it. I think it'd be the same type of thing here. If, if at some point, you know, dear moon would be a real clincher. If, if they're sending humans around the moon on a, on a rocket that a single person could send 12, or, you know, 10 people around the moon, uh, cheaper, you know, a hundred times cheaper, 10 times cheaper or whatever than, than SLS and Orion and in luxury, then that might wake some people up. That might go, wait, 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 wait. They can already do this. Like we don't have to invest in it. We can just purchase a ticket. Then that might, that might be when it really does change the game. Um, uh, I, that might be, of course, a ways out. And it would have to, yeah. So I, yes, I do think right now the risk is almost zero because I don't think anyone's going to change their mind based on promises or ideas or concepts. It'll have to be proven out with a real track record and a real price before it changes any minds. And, and like, it has to be substantial. It can't just be like, yeah, this one is a little cheaper because there's gonna be a lot of lobbying to keep the Artemis program and SLS and Orion safe uh, from any changes. So it'll have to be like substantial. So that's kind of my micro rant there about kind of the Artemis program. But, uh, you know, realistically, like I said, it, it just might be a long time. So. That's, yeah, that's going to do it for this Spacewalk podcast. Again, uh, I hope that you guys, you remember, you can find this thing anywhere. If you're listening on YouTube, you can find it on any of your podcast readers. If you're on a podcast reader and you actually like to have YouTube up, we do, we do some slight little bit of graphics, just like a picture inside a TV, like when you're talking about things. So if you do want that, make sure and subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, if you are a supporter, thank you so much for your support. And we hope to get to as many of your questions as possible. If you want to support the work I do, uh, the best way is probably through Patreon still. Patreon.com slash Everyday Astronaut. Or, you know, if you're a ex-subscriber or a YouTube member, we'll also be pulling questions from there. But again, even if you're just listening, that's, that's plenty of support. Just give me a thumbs up, a five-star review, or whatever star review you think is fair on any podcast reader. And be sure and use hashtag Spacewalk Podcast, and we'll maybe be able to find your questions too. Well, that's it for round two. Uh, hope you guys are enjoying these. Please let me know if you have any suggestions, any other thoughts on these episodes. Uh, but yeah, that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I hope you join me on my next spacewalk.